Well, we are here today to explain how you can reach billions of devices using the Google Assistant, and of course, connected through the Google Cloud Platform, right? So before we can start on some like deep dive on how you can extend your service, your app application for the Google Assistant, we would like to give you a rough introduction about the Google Assistant, right? The actions on Google. Totally, just in case you haven't actually used yes. Google Assistant. Yeah. Ooh, can you hear me? Sweet, all right. So just in case you haven't used Google Assistant, which I'm assuming everyone has, hopefully, but there might be one person, Google Assistant is all about the conversation that users can have with Google. You could say something like, hey, G, um, get this done. Hey, G, remind me this. I'm using the term hey, G, because I don't want to actually activate my phone nor your phone. <laughs> um, so it's a way that users can talk to Google and be more productive in their day. And a way that we do that is by having over a billion devices. Yeah, exactly. For example, during many days, you surely interact with different devices, right? When you wake up, you already pick your phone from your, your, your nightstand, and then when you are uh, driving, you, are, you want to hear something during this day, or even if you're running, you're, you can use one of the headphones, for example, with the Google Assistant. So across the day, you are using different devices, and I'm pretty sure that you want to reach the, the, the users around this day, right along this journey. So we can offer your content not only on your website, on your smartphone, so we can extend for across sense across surfaces, right? Totally, and it's not just devices, it's also different languages. So Google Assistant is available in multiple different languages. That way we're meeting the users where they're at in the language that's most um, comfortable for them as well. So we spent a lot of time building out these different locales and languages so that it, we could provide the best service for users. Yeah, for example, as you can notice, I'm not an English native speaker. And of course, if I had the choice to talk in Brazilian Portuguese with my assistant, it would be great. Because then sometimes I, I don't need to keep translating on my mind simple things like turn the lights on. Because it can sound simply, but imagine you're already, okay, I talk in English for the full day, I want to chill out at my house, and <laughs> I don't like to keep talking English sometimes. Or even I have children, they have five and seven years, they are learning English yet, so they prefer to interact in Portuguese. So, and imagine you can reach, for example, we are talking about the, probably the most populous country in the world, Brazil, uh, India, so, uh, UK, Spanish, so you have a lot of options of language, so in Spanish you can talk with all the Latin America countries, so it's a way you can make your action available for uh, across many countries. Totally, which is cool to be like, yeah, Google Assistant does that, but what does that mean for us as developers? Like, what can yeah. I do with this? And this is where I get really excited because we can use that all those billion devices in these different languages to really expose our content to other users as well. And so I'd like to start off with um, just some terminology yeah, because we use the same cool. logo um, for Google Assistant, which is a conversation between Google and users. And then there are the actual devices. That's the hardware that exists. And Actions on Google is the platform that allows developers to extend the Google ex Assistant experience. Yeah, I, I like to explain this picture. Exactly. If, uh, <laughs> for example, I have a Android development background and, and full stack development background. So at the beginning, it took me a time to understand where the components are fitting together. So for example, here in the Google Assistant, can imagine this as your, the web or the Android platform, where all the, action, the apps or your web apps live, where the call actions on Google. The, mm -hmm. Sorry, the devices that, that have it working, like your phone. And the apps are the actions. So it's just a new name for apps. Uh, it's like instead of saying I'm developing app, an application for the Google Assistant, we're developing actions. Because we believe that you're not developing only the experience of uh, running an app, but much more you are interacting as an action. You are running an action using the Google Assistant. So I like to establish this compara the comparison if you want to keep in mind, like Google Assistant is your platform, actions on Google is your apps, and devices are your smartphones or your browser, it depends on where you compare to. Definitely, so Actions on Google is just the platform in which developers can build applications or actions that we call yeah. it within our, our world um, to expose that content and to have that functionality. So how does it all work? So we're gonna start off on the right-hand side. Imagine Neto speaking this. He's saying something like, okay, G, talk to personal chef. It's a made-up um, action that we made. And so what happens there is the device, here's the keyword, 
um, grabs the audio and sends that audio over to Google Assistant. Google Assistant will translate that audio to text. We're going to use our own natural language processing. We're going to use a user's preference. We do our own um, uh, machine learning ranking as well as the user's profile to figure out what does Nethel actually want when he says that. And because he explicitly said the name of an action that exists, what's going to happen is Google Assistant is going to ping my actions back end and go, hey, someone wants to talk to your action. Yeah, exactly. And this is the cool point because, for example, in this first part, you can since for the beginning, you can handle all the communication with your service. So if you have, for example, premium service, premium entitlements, or you would like to check the person is logged or not, you can start right away from the first interaction. So because the Google Assistant in this case, it's working more as, as, a, as a bridge between the user and your application. It's like you are take your phone, open the launcher, and selecting one app is what you are doing here. You are saying to assess that app, the, the, this action, this case. Yeah, definitely, because after that, if you notice, Google Assistant doesn't do much after it makes the connection. After that, it's all on us. So we create the response we want to give, and we give that response in a text form, um, in a JSON format, and we send it over to Google Assistant. Google Assistant will then will translate that text to speech, and then send that audio over to the device and actually respond back to um, Netho. Yes, exactly. And the cool stuff you, you might think, be thinking like, OK, so on my back end, I have to do, for example, a bunch of natural language processing stuff yeah. to understand what the user said and then identify what, it, what the user wants. Not so, not many work, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. Users are unique and different. I know for myself, um, if you were to ask my partner, um, he would definitely contest that I'm not the most articulate person, especially when it's something of things that I want in my needs. And let me put in my password. <laughs> uh, so then in processing users and Yeah, for example, in this case, what we are saying that you don't need to implement your own natural language processing to handle different accents, different languages. We have a tool for you mm -hmm. to do that. It's Dialogflow. And please raise the hand who already Oh, who knows what this dialogue flow is? OK. Sweet. So we have a, That's awesome. Okay. Oh. So basically, it's like intent matching and entity extraction. So dialogue flow is doing all the work for you in terms of identifying uh, words the user said, the intent, so, or, or what the user wants to do. And then you match exactly to the part of mm -hmm. your code. Mm -hmm. And this is cool because, for example, you don't need to have different backends for different languages. We're going to go through yeah. this on one of our demos. You can have your only one single backend that you handle all the requests, because mm -hmm. everything will be handled in terms of language and processing by Dialogflow. Yes. So where does that live within our um, kind of flow of data? Yeah. So that lives actually between a Google Assistant and your backend. And so it lives actually right here. And what Dialogflow is going to do, it's going to get that raw text of the user's utterance. And it's going to use its own natural language processing to figure out what do they mean when they say a statement, and then try to match it with predefined functionalities as a developer we have defined. And if it doesn't match with anything, we have a default fallback intent, which I like to think as the else statement of all my intents. And it will be captured through there. And so Dialogflow just sits right between. And then it hits our code going, hey, they're hitting this part of your function, this function. And here are any of the parameters that you have asked me to send to you as well. And then at that point, we just make our queries to our database, do our jazz, create the response, and then send that back to Dialogflow, Dialogflow to Google Assistant. Google Assistant translates that text to speech, and then that audio gets sent to the device. And this in less than milliseconds. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about overhead timing. And because when the user asks something, you have kind of eight seconds yeah. to reply, unless so if you don't reply in eight seconds, the connection will be closed as timeout. Because of course, we don't want to have actions listening to you all the time. So it will be closed in eight seconds. And you say, you might think, OK, you have assistant, dialogue flow, my backend, reading data, returning this all the way around. Yeah, it will take less than a few milliseconds. So you can rely, you can focus on your own code. Cool. So we wanted to talk about seeing that there's so many people who have um, used Dialogflow, really wanted to talk about localizing it. 
Because it's one thing to build an action, especially in your own native language. You build it, and you're like, this is awesome. It's all the functionality. It's doing what I want. And now the next thing is, how do I expose this to so many other people? Because it's on the billion devices. But if somebody is at their own home, and they're only speaking one language, you won't have access to them. So what we did um, for this particular action it is um, for GDG, which I believe they were talking about that um, in the talk prior about Google Developer Groups. And so this is a project that I've been building out where a Google Developer Group organizer can just connect to their Meetup API, and it has a fully function um, action that will provide information like when's the next Meetup, when's the last Meetup, who's the organizer, how many people are there. And it's super easy for our GDGs to, to set up. And so the first thing that I did to make it localized was, um, let's see, next, was, of course, this is um, the way that we have our, I'm using Node.js because we have our client library um, in that language, in JavaScript. And so I have an index.js file. And I had all my code and all my responses there. And so the first thing I need to do in order to localize my action was I need to actually pull out all the responses. And so I just separate it, have all my responses in another, um, another file, and I pulled it in whenever I wanted. This really helped me think about the responses of my action in big categories. Because I had to find, this is the greeting. My, this is the greeting for new users versus the greeting of returning users, which is naturally going to be different. Because when I first met, met Neto, I had to go, hey, Neto, I'm Jessica. You know, I, I'm from Calexico. This is kind of my background. I gave him a lot of information the first time I meet him. But the 10th time I meet him, I just go, hey, Neto, and that's it. And so your actions want to have that flexibility, too. And so by, by pulling out your responses, you have to kind of think about what you want to label the responses. After that, um, because you already have that pulled out, you're going to um, want to have that even further separated, where you have a lo locales um, directory. And in there, you have your files for every single language using the same skeleton of your JSON of your primary language, which this one was in English. And so that way, when you're using a, a client library, you can figure out which language it's working with. So that's the second step I did. After that, um, I, I used i18n, pulled that in, as well as moment. And what I had to do was just do some configuration, going, hey, this is where my, loca my locales are going to be. And these are the fallbacks of the different, or the different languages that I might not have predefined. So one of them is for Spanish. And so we have Spanish, which is ES419. And then we also have Spanish, which is ES-ES. -ES. So 419 means it's Latin America. ES-ES -ES means that it's in Spain, which is very different Spanishes. Um, I'm treating them the same, so I'm just saying go to my um, same Spanish file and use that. But you can have um, further granularity within that as well. So that's the next thing I did. And then within my code, I just had to do a little bit of refactoring. And so this is my welcome, yes, my welcome intent. And so what's happening here is that when my user activates the action, it will greet them. And so first thing that happens is I will localize the conversation. I would figure out where is the user from? What is their locale, like the language they're using, which I get from the conversational object that gets passed back and forth between the user and me as a developer. So I localize it. And then I do some funny jazz about um, suggestion chips. Don't worry about that. And then I have an if statement asking if I've seen that user before. And if I have seen them, I'm going to give them a message of the welcome back text. And so you can see I'm using i18n dot double underscore, passing in that string of the name of the response. And then it creates that uh, message for, my, for me in the appropriate language. And then it will send it using the com dot ask. Oh, you can't see that. Let me go on the mouse. Maybe yeah, you can see it there. Then we do, can we see this mouse? Yeah, maybe? Thumbs up. People can see. Oh, thank you. Uh, and then you do it here with com.ask, sending in that speech um, message, and then the message in text form. I have two variations. I have a message that's in the audio and message that is in just text format, because my audio text actually has natural line breaks that I've put in to make it sound more natural. And I've actually messed with the grammar. And so instead of asking questions with a question mark, I'm asking questions with a period because it changes how the audio is heard as well. And so I did that for every language, tricking the grammar slightly. I did ask for a lot of help from coworkers. Um, I asked a lot of help from Neto to translate it into Portuguese. So thank you so much. Yeah, and imagine, for example, sometimes you on the speech side, imagine you're having a conversation. We are not, you're not building 
voice comments. It's their difference. Voice comments are one thing, conversations are another thing. So uh, the point is, when you are providing information through voice, you need sometimes to give more detail. So for example, if I say uh, to show some example uh, and give you some example, from the visual perspective, this example can be a suggestion chip on the response. But this won't be audible for the user that, does not have a, that doesn't have an, uh, a screen available. So we need to give the example in the speech part. So this is the importance when you have to separate the speech between the text and why you should separate them. Definitely. And it was actually really simple to localize because literally it's the same code except I've changed I've added this i18.n under double underscore, um, and that's the only thing once I've pulled it out. So making your action localized when it comes to the code part, super easy. The translation is a little diff bit different, so hopefully you have really good friends that speak multiple languages to help you out on that. And we have another. We have Sphero, which is a fantastic IoT action. Yeah, exactly. Well, one, of, one of our jobs as developer advocates, that I tend to say that's the most fun job in the world, we have to play with some toys, some things to study, right? To work. This is the good part of being a developer advocate. And one challenge is how you can imagine, OK, we are building actions that are going to run on devices. But if you have any startup or have an idea and you are building a hardware or any other appliance and you like to make it work with the Google Assistant, how it can work? We have, for example, the home automation framework with home graph. But if it's not for home automation, if I have like this robot, I want to control this over voice. And this idea came when my daughter saw this <laughs> toy in, the, in, a, in, a, in a store, in a shopping, and I said, yeah, looks like a nice toy. But I had to find an adult excuse to buy it, right? So I said, yeah, maybe it's a good, so I can try with Google Assistant. And I realized it when, she was trying to control the, the Sphero, and she started yelling at the Sphero, stop, stop. I said, cool. I think it's easier to control this over voice mm -hmm. than using a, a, a smart a, a phone or using uh, a, a joystick. OK, joystick could be cool, but OK, it's another thing. So uh, what I decided to do is to showcase how you could integrate any kind of hardware. So uh, for in this case specifically, this little ball it is using BLI, Bluetooth Low Energy. So what I have here, it's a Raspberry Pi. And I'm using a Raspberry Pi for uh, the reason that I want to have something on my desk that I can try deploy. But you can, for example, build an Android app that connects through the Bluetooth and run in your phone if you want, right? So here we have a code that, that using the Sphero Node.js library is sending commands to control the Sphero. And you know? Nothing new, right? I'm just using the pre-existing API to send commands over Bluetooth and make the ball run, right? But if I say, OK, G, talk to Roball, and hey, go forward, go backward, turn left, turn right. So then we decided to do this. Uh, I was planning to show it live, but the amount of Wi-Fi networks here is interfering with the the Wi-Fi signal, and to avoid other surprises, I'm going to show you one of the videos. It's this one of, we were testing this, and OK, just play. Is the volume? Talk to Robo. Move short forward. Okay. <laughs> Move medium backward. Move left short. Okay. Move right medium. Okay. So all these commands Pencil. are going through Dialogflow. I created some entities to identify the movement, like forward, medium, uh, forward, backward, left, and right. And I, I added this uh, uh, speed component, like uh, slow or fast to indicate how amount of time should move in this case. So of course, this is a, is a toy project. The code will be soon released on our GitHub with a blog post that's coming together. But you can imagine this as, I don't know, you are building appliance, you are building a, something cool, and you like to control this using the voice. And 
with the assistant, right? Yeah, that's super cool. So I know we only have like 10 seconds left. 10, um, yeah. Just wanted to do a shout out. If you do build an action and um, you go into review, it gets deployed on production level. Um, you do get automatically entered into our Actions on Good community, which means you get a cool shirt. And then let me read this because I always say it wrong. $200 of cloud credits per month for a year, which is great. To that, run your action background. That money could be used to translate your action <laughs> using the Translate API as well. Yeah. Um, and then this is usually the photo that I recommend to everyone to take. If you're interested in building for Actions on Google, this contains all the cool links um, and resources to start off. So we highly recommend to actually start off using our code labs. And so yes. it's on the right hand. It's the second one, code labs. Go there. Try our code labs. That way you can get your hands dirty and build an action for yourself. And if you're going to Google I.O., please visit us there. We'll be there all the days. We have new code labs coming for the Google I.O. And Teasers. Yes, we'll be there. So, And we will be here on the at somewhere, I think, the office hours booth for some time. We have some pens and, and nice tracks. So please. If you have any question, we are happy to answer. Yes, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.